And welcome to this amazing season two Vox Talk. And today's special guest is the sensational, absolute world beating trumpet superstar, Mr. Louis Dowswell. Hello, Louis. Hello. Hello. Nice to see you guys. Thanks for having me. It's like a complete honor. And we are super buzzed and psyched about this because um, all of our kids have known you for absolutely ages. And we've got a great working relationship with Yamaha. We know how amazing you are. So we think this is going to be a great chat and we're going to be talking about all sorts of things you know about your journey to how you got to where you are today maybe some of your favorite moments and a little bit about yamaha horns and then also you know we've got some student questions from a guy who's ready to uh, feed those into the chat by a guy called Stu. Yeah. so um you know if for those people who've not come across you before louis is there any chance you can just give us a little synopsis of who you are what you do and you know how you got here yeah, for sure. Cool. So uh, my name is Lou Dowswell. I'm a trumpet player in London. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I guess <clears throat> I've been asked to speak a little bit about where I come from, where uh, and and where I, where, you know, how I got here. So basically, uh, I was born in Stevenage, um, and we moved to the southwest of England in Bristol. Um, and I went to school there. My mum is a music teacher. And she ran a big band in uh, started in 1997. So I was about four years old when that band started. Uh, it's a nice little opportunity to to hear some, you know, semi-professional big band playing and really kind of get, which by the way for me was like amazing. You know, every single week we'd go and yeah. check it out. And um, yeah, that was kind of like my first sort of introduction to music. And she got us learning piano at four. Uh, I started learning the drums at about uh, five and the trumpet at seven. um and yeah i mean it was just one thing after another Uh, when i was 10 i went to the world's cathedral school which is a specialist music music school for musicians and um stayed there till i was 16 um learning trumpet and percussion and drums um and a bit of piano um although i was never very good at piano unfortunately um and uh and then i moved to the purcell school in watford where i currently reside or nearby um not in the school just in Watford and um <laughs> and we uh yeah I was there till I was 18 uh, again another specialist music school Purcell school very cool um really enjoyed those couple of years and then I went to the Royal Academy of Music in uh, Baker Street or near near Baker Street uh in London and stayed there till 2016 and then I just kind of went into the world of music and tried to make a living like all of us do you know so that's kind of my journey uh pretty institutionalized I guess but uh, at the same time I had some moments outside of that uh, with things like the National Youth Jazz Orchestra and a couple other um, bands I played in along the way so yeah it's been cool. That's cool man. Did you um did you manage to get some good teachers on the way you know who were the sort of people who were giving you the guidance you know because I mean the Wells Cathedral School is cool very cool I don't really know Purcell as much or the guys there but I know the Academy's got great guys Nick Smart, Mark Hodge yeah. and people who were yeah, the people yeah. that you know yeah, did the good things for you? Well, I had a ton of really great teachers. Um, the head of brass at Wells uh, is a guy called Paul Denegri, and he was uh, super inspirational for me, particularly when I was about nine or ten years old. Um, you know, he was like my trumpet daddy. We had a you know, really great relationship, and we, we worked together. He kind of took me to grade eight and beyond, and um, that was really cool. Another guy there called Simon Jones, fantastic teacher. Yeah. Learned a load from him. And then when I went to um, Purcell, I actually didn't study with anyone classically for a couple of years. I studied with Steve Waterman, the great jazz trumpet player. And um, and that was kind of my beginnings of learning stuff from the jazz world because I've been classically trained mainly up until then. <laughs> and then um, and then when I got to the academy, it was uh, it was uh, Mike Lovett and Simon Gardner and Mark David, um, who... It's a classical player, head of head of brass. But man, if you have a problem on the trumpet and you want it solved, you just go to Mark and it gets solved. He's yeah. he's one of those, you know. Here's a di- you know, what's your problem? This is the diagnostic. Here's the solution. It's just fantastic. Just the way I'd like to kind of have lessons. So he was absolutely amazing. So it's a, and Paul Beniston as well, absolutely incredible trumpet player. Um, used to play with the LPO, or maybe still does, I think. So it's been a, uh, it's been, I've been very fortunate to have some of the most amazing teachers. I also took some lessons off the, the world famous Wayne Bergeron over in Los Angeles, um, which I was very lucky to have, and and maybe my biggest idol um, on the trumpet. So very very fortunate for that. But you know, 
That's what yeah, it is. Very cool, it's mate. Cool. It, it's super cool. And like what I'm noticing from that is that you've done, you've had so many different teachers. And like a lot of our kids realize that, you know, they think you have one teacher, but actually there's lots of people that input into oh, making yeah. who you are, people to do the technique, the chops, Mike, you know, on the chops or the range stuff. You know, I mean, I'm talking about trumpets, but it, it applies for everybody, whether you're on tubs or piano. Absolutely. You've got to go out there and meet people, haven't you? The most important thing, I think, with re- regards to teaching is, you know, when you get to a certain stage with your playing as a, as a kid, um, you you need to start hearing like a more diverse um, set of ideas um, because not everyone is the same. And some of your teachers will be fantastic for some things and uh, maybe there's someone else who's better for another thing. And, and that could be the complete opposite to somebody else. So if you are with, you know, let's say you have one teacher and, and, and you feel as though you'd like to get another opinion on something, you, you should go and do that if you if you can, because you you should basically just take in as much information as you can, soak it up like a sponge and uh, and just try try to enjoy it all. But you might get a different take from somebody else. Um, that's not to suggest that your other teacher's not good enough. It's just that there's lots, there's just lots of opinions out there. And sometimes... I mean, the the biggest moments for me when I was learning were always those those light bulb moments. You know, yeah. when you're sitting there and someone says something to you and it just goes bing, and you go, oh, why has no one ever said that to me just like that? You know, they yeah. said it like that, but bef- someone else has said it before, but they haven't said it quite like that. And then it resonates with you, and then you can take that bit, that gem of information, and move it, you know, move it forwards. So it's always good to go and get as many opinions as you can. And and the same thing is, you don't necessarily even need to take one-on-one lessons you can also go to youtube there's a plethora of information out there um uh some good some bad but at the same time you know um the bad stuff is good to see and to and to learn you know maybe take it to your teacher and see what they think you know it's there's tons of stuff out there you should just go explore because it's super 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 exciting right now you know yeah man totally is and i think a lot of our kids realize that they are in charge of their own destiny they're in charge of their own yes. input now you can that's the great thing about youtube and it's really democratized education anybody can go and look at anything and think what do i think about it you yes. can access it and you know we're talking about teaching and now i know you do tons of um, you know like amazing things and teaching is part of it what sort of stuff uh, bearing in mind not this year because it's 2020 but what sort of stuff were you doing before the lockdown you know a bit of producing a bit of playing you know yeah how did it work out for you where was your i, you I guess if you broke down my finances <laughs> um the <laughs> vast majority of my income was coming from actually performing on the trumpet um yeah. doing that job itself and probably the vast majority of that was what i would consider to be like tradesman trumpet work so maybe as a side man or, or or recording a jingle for a, an advert or playing on a movie. You know, these are all sort of things that I consider to be quite tradesman like, you know, you go turn up to the job, you get given the music, you play it and they're happy. That's that's kind of the vast majority of the work I was doing. And then there's the other side of things, which is like kind of the artist side of the job, which is uh, being a guest soloist with a band or um being a clinician talking was kind of more educational but you know it's still this branding thing so for me you know with my brand if you will my youtube brand like that artist side of things it it takes a lot more time and money investment in to get started but the out the output is potentially much higher so um you have to balance it really you have to get the tradesman thing right so that you can pay your mortgage or your rent um and your bills and then you also have to try and invest some time in the artist side of things to try and get yourself to a point where you can have that eventually take over if you want some people don't want that some people want a life of being you know a side man playing personally i actually love doing that because i get to play with my friends you know and other colleagues which maybe as an artist you don't get to do so much you sort of travel a lot on your own you stay in a hotel room on your own you know so it's it's a different lifestyle but it's something that you could definitely dip your toe into both of if if you can create the platform for yourself in the first place. But um, that's the trumpet side of things. And then uh, the other side of things is the production side of things and um, the mixing and stuff like that. Uh, we worked on a record for one of my uh, business partners, Callum Al, um, uh, just before, I guess it, it came out just before lockdown or maybe during lockdown. Either way, we finished it in January in Los Angeles. We went to a mastering engineer over there uh, called Gavin Lurson. It's absolutely fantastic. But we recorded this big orchestral record over in air about a year previous, maybe just the middle of 2019. 
had his like 80 piece orchestra recorded this whole thing in this amazing amazing church space and um and i had to mix that record it was for the vocalist is a lady called claire and um absolutely amazing vocalist it was just absolute i I loved working on that project it was i i absolutely threw myself at it as well because i'd never worked on something quite so big time you know it it was huge and i was incredibly detailed about how i mixed it i i took loads of time over it much more time than maybe was financially viable but it's important to take pride in these things yeah. especially with people like callum who i'm very close with and and, uh, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about later when it comes down to the arranging side of things for my band but you know um it's been a uh, it's been fun and uh i'm just getting into sort of oh i shouldn't say just getting into mixing i've been mixing a long time but i just i'm just getting into commercializing that a little bit because i feel as though i'm I'm capable and ready to do that. And I think ha- coming at it from a musician's point of view is actually quite different. A lot of mixing engineers and um, they do amazing stuff, but they, they have different ears. They hear things differently. And, and that's really important. As I said before, diversity of opinions is really, really important. So it's really, uh, it, it's cool coming at it from the musician's point of view because mus- musicians can relate to me. They can say, like, you know, for Trump, like when you're mixing a trumpet, for example, it's like I know what a trumpet should sound like, like yeah. really, really well. So I, I'm pretty clear on that, you know. Um, whereas there might be another mixing engineer, for example, who came from electronic music background, um, and they're doing something completely different. So I'd love to get, dip my toe into electronic music and maybe go down that way a little bit in the future. But right now, acoustic music, um, that's kind of my my bag, and um, and and it's it's a cool thing to be able to do. Um, I feel as though like being a producer on a record, um, you have at least as much control over how something sounds sonically as the arranger does. You know, even though they're putting the notes down, you, you get to you get to mess around with all of it at the end and and make it sound as top notch as you can. And I I personally love doing that kind of thing. So it's been it's fun. Totally the uh, the way that you shape and craft something is just ridiculous as a producer and you know the engineers. Uh, uh, Ut- utmost respect for people who like doing that you know it's a, a great thing and i think that um that album was grammy nominated wasn't it the one with claire it was a grammy nominated we submitted it for a grammy unfortunately it wasn't nominated in the end we we really hoped it, would, it was it was going to get there but you know it's quite difficult the the grammy thing is um a lot of it is to do with who you know in the recording academy that's not to suggest that the records that d- did get nominated didn't deserve it. they absolutely no. did it's just that it's ve- it's very rare. I think maybe Jacob Collier and maybe a couple other people have been able to do it, but it's very rare for someone who isn't in the US and or maybe more just right. in the UK to be able to to get that out to to the Recording Academy people because I'm not sure how many people there are that are making these votes, but they vote on it yeah. uh, once it's been submitted, and then the, the five highest votes go into the into the nomination for the for the thing. So you need to know people that are recording academy and Callum and I aren't quite networked up that way. So either way, or 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 it just wasn't good enough. But I think it was pretty yeah. good. So it was, it was damn fine. It was absolutely killer. Um, did you go to college at the same time as Jacob? Then I seem to think Jacob. Yeah, I was in the same year as him, and I went to school with him. Yeah, so ah. we were at school uh, same year at Purcell um and then we went to college and he dropped out in the middle of college because he went on to be a superstar so yeah (laughs) just like you i should say (laughs) i didn't drop out (laughs) um so obviously you know i think music's an amazing thing to have in people's lives and we know that you do as well and for me the moment that did it for me was when i was at ronnie scott's and i was 18 years old and i saw frank foster lead the um basie big band and from that moment onwards my next gig was maynard ferguson at ronnie's and, you know, being a trumpet player as well, it was that light bulb moment that made me want to do it more than anything else. Have you got anything like that that was seminal for you? Yeah, I'm, I'm ter- terribly jealous of your two, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I think maybe it, it's difficult, right? Because I was in these environments of being in music school. And, I mean, originally I wanted to be a pilot. Um, uh, and... It was funny because when I heard when I mean, when I went, when I went to music school, there was almost like a no expectation that you would do this, but like if you were one of maybe you know the the the, the better players in that environment, like you felt as though you should, and that it was like your destiny to do it, right? 
so part part of me being a musician is just being maybe quite good at it when I was young and it just felt like that that was what I was going to do and as I got older and started playing on gigs and things like that like realizing that actually this is actually quite a, a exciting lifestyle it's quite interesting I mean not that I had anything to compare it to because I haven't done a job before um which I'm ashamed to say um but uh, I'd be very fortunate to have, have been able to do that but from an inspirational point of view um to be honest with you, uh, maybe it's just maybe it was just the Gordon and Goodwin's big fat band, you know. Like I never heard them live, but for me, when my mum played me that record that was released in 1999, I think I must have heard it in 2001 or something, 2002. Um, I didn't know who this trumpet player was who was playing lead trumpet on it. Um, and at the time, you know what? A lot of a lot of people that weren't in the U.S. probably didn't know who Wayne was, but very quickly he became quite famous um, for various reasons, of course. But I, I heard this band and uh, on record, and um, I was like, "Wow, this is just the best thing." We used to listen to it in the car all the time. It was the only thing that was in the car. So you should listen to that, you know, the "Swinging for the Fences" album. Yeah. And then, um, and then, like, I mean, this is obviously far into my career, but it, it, when I got a chance to play with them when I was, I think, twenty-three. Wow, it's four years ago now. Wow. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I remember just getting uh, very emotional about getting a call for that gig because I, more than anything else, I never thought that I would ever even see the band when I was a kid because I was like, oh, Los Angeles is this other planet, you know, somewhere else in, in the universe. You know, I never thought I'd even see them. But to then be the first time I see the band standing at the back of it playing instead of Wayne, yeah. um, that was quite terrifying, but also very humbling and like very... Um, yeah, it was a really, really amazing moment for me. So I think the inspiration to go into playing music was quite a lot to do with that band in the first place. And when I got a chance to play with them, you know, um, in in Manchester as well, that was cool. Like doing it in the UK, um, it was quite an amazing experience. Must be said. Man, I, t- I totally agree because um, it was 2004 when uh, we were in LA and we were watching. Um, Wayne and Gordon's band live in LA and we got to go in and sit in on the soundtrack a uh, sound check wow. and we watched Wayne play um Count Bubba um, yeah. you know it was all the songs from the uh, first album and then when they came off stage and we just all hung around and they were just normal guys they yeah. like geniuses on stage normal guys and actually yeah. that um that gig it kind of showed me the value of um developing relationships and friendships for a long time you know for a period of time because actually the night's gig bernie dressel who was the drummer at the time yeah um he wouldn't use one of the little ipads which had all the music on digitally he wanted all of his sheet music and of course yeah. it was like and a half four thousand people in the auditorium and literally bernie tried to change his music on sing sang song and it just went everywhere <laughs> which was awesome but you know and then, but uh, gordon was like of course you know bernie if you'd been using your gear this would never have <laughs> you'd get paid loads of money to uh, try and use stuff but you know i think it's really important that guys you know it's not just about the music it's about building and nurturing relationships over a long period of time because they'll help you you'll help them everybody gets more music and it's big success and you know that's part of the reason why i think we're here today is because yamaha we've worked with yamaha before and they they always support the right people at the right time you know we all you we, me and Stu, we used bobby shoe trumpets and flugel horns when we were growing up and you know i think it's very cool that you are um like an endorsed by yamaha so how did that all happen and you know is it working out well for you that was great i uh, love yamaha always have done um I, I don't know maybe i should explain a little bit about my, about my trumpet journey anyway um i started on a bark trumpet um uh when i was a kid and then um i bought one of these actually <clears throat> one of these yamaha silver wayne bergeron trumpets here yeah. um and i did my when i was recording little videos in 2011 i was recording them on this with a different mouthpiece not this exact horn but this version um and uh, i love this horn and then i went on like a bit of a journey through a few different um companies like trying different things you know through through my early 20s just trying to sort of um just experiment a bit i guess um i ended up working with bark for quite a while and that that was cool um but then uh yamaha released this yamaha commercial trumpet the 6335rc and uh jeremy came to me the artist liaison he said would you like to try this you know just out of interest what do you think 
I played it and I really liked it. It was a really nimble horn. Um, it was quite compact and it got me sort of playing the way I remembered playing. Um, yeah. It's kind of, I always had a Bobby shoe the whole time through this journey and I would always go back to that occasionally. But, you know, I, I really enjoyed this, the, how nimble this horn was and it felt like they had done something else with their horns. Not that, even not that there was even a problem with them before, but like even, uh, even bigger improvement so um i decided to give that a try for a while and, and then i signed on as an artist because i was happy with it and then you know the great thing for me with yamaha is that they, they've got so many different options for commercial trumpets um and they it's really you know they, they take me over to hamburg and we'll try different horns out and we'll um you know tweak little things here and there i'm very fortunate to have this you know this option um and they're very very um kind and generous to 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 do it for me uh, but it means I basically get the trumpet I want um, without um, faffing around trying to find, you know, shops with six or seven of different ones. I, I get to go to Hamburg. They've got like 20 of these yeah. different ones. And I try my favorite one out and then we make adjustments. And it's it's a really great thing. And it's been a great relationship since we since we started um, a couple of years ago now, I think. And uh, and I, I feel as though I've done like a full circle, you know, um, as I said, I. I recorded some stuff on this when i was really young and then um and then i'm back to it this is the same horn you know uh, this is the one i picked up from hamburg last year um and i just love it it's just it's just amazing um i feel as though on yamaha trumpets um you know everyone talks about like old oh, barks have got the sound and you know yamahas have got the tuning and the consistency I, I feel as though it's not really as straightforward as that um uh for one i think the yeah, sound guy's got more control of your sound than you do but yeah. Yeah, that's another <laughs> thing um i think it, the great thing about trumpets uh is uh, with the yamaha trumpets is i feel as though there's i have more ways to play a certain phrase it gives me more options so maybe on trumpets that i had before i'd have this difficult phrase coming up or this high note that i wanted to attack in a certain way you know and I, what I would find a lot of the time was that there was only one way that that would come out cleanly and how I would like it. And with Yamaha trumpets, I feel as though I, I can make more musical decisions in that moment. I have a bit more confidence on the horn to do what I want it to do. And I feel as though that's all you can really ask for. You know, if you've got a trumpet that will do what you want it to do, that's better than any other trumpet because trumpet never does what you want it to do. <laughs> so um, I, I feel as though that's uh, that's kind of the best the best thing about it for me and you know uh i think everyone should try them out they're, they're yeah. amazing so i mean i agree and like having been a trumpet player who's played lots of different trumpets myself i think the thing that i noticed the most about um yamaha trumpets or the bobby shoe that i still you know use is the fact that no matter what sort of day i wake up on because you know sometimes i can wake up feeling amazing and everything works and so other days it's like a real grind yeah Trumpet always delivers rather than it's, you know, it's, it's down to me to make sure that I do the um, the hard work in that. Because, you know, sometimes if you've been up late, you're playing till two in the morning, you've smashed your face up, you know, the next day, you, you Yamaha and you know where you are with it. Whereas like with some of the other horns that I've done, it's just one of those things that you pick up, isn't it, over the years. It really yeah. makes a difference for me. And so. also, I think for younger players as well, who maybe aren't quite as um, uh, aware of the limitations of different instruments. One thing I have noticed that the worst possible Yamaha that you could be unfortunate to get is far better than the worst possible of other instruments. You know, like they're from a consistency point of view, I wouldn't say that their, their top end is any different necessarily, because if you go to bark or something and you get a real great top end bark, then you got lucky, right? And it will be great. But the thing is, you can also get super duff instruments from other companies. So the thing about Yamaha is that I really truly believe that if you went to a shop and bought one, you wouldn't be getting, you know, a bad instrument, which I think is really important. Uh, and their student range is amazing as well. And I'm not just saying that because I've been told to. I know it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> it really is. And, you know, I know that Wayne is um, still a Yamaha artist as well. And, you know, what sort of what does the future hold for Yamaha and Louis, do you think? Are they is are Yamaha looking to try and get you out there more clinician based work or are they just are they working with you for the brand? What is it? Do you think there's a you know a bit of a journey there? Hopefully. I mean, um, what do you think a little bit about the uh, the guys that they're sort of um, if you think a little bit about 
the guys that they've currently got, like their flagship guys with the flagship models, you know, um, uh, Eric Miyashiro, Wayne Bergeron, um, yeah. those guys, Bobby Shu, of course. Um, I think that maybe I get the impression that they maybe wanted to inject a little bit of youth into into what they're doing as a brand anyway. Um, and I feel quite you know honored to to have taken that side of things. I am aware, of course, as well that it is youth um and 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 that i must be patient um with with what they have with their plans i um i'm in no rush to to start developing any models or anything like that i get asked that question quite a lot are you coming out with a yamaha trumpets that that's not on the cards at the moment and and i don't expect it to be for a long time if ever but yeah. uh but the thing for me is that i can't there's plenty for me to choose from so i can still go and get basically what i want um uh which is great I, uh, I I I think maybe in the future there there might there might be an opportunity to do something in the way of development, but um, it's all going to depend on on a few things. Um, they're currently trying to bring out uh, a few other models at the moment, I believe, uh, which is really really exciting. Um, I'm not sure how much I can talk talk about that, but I know that there are um, some models that are coming out soon that 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 I'm very excited about. So um, uh, and maybe when the next models come through, I, I might get a little uh way of you know uh input if you see what i mean i i i guess they could have considered me to have put some input into the 6335rc um not a huge amount because i i the horn was almost um finalized by the time i started playing it but i definitely did some play testing for them um with regards to clinic, clinician work yeah uh, bring it on I, I love doing clinics um uh, and the more of these I can do for Yamaha, the better. Uh, it's good for me. It's good for for them, I hope. So that's uh, that's kind of where we're at, at the moment. I'm just taking it slow, trying to enjoy trying to enjoy being an old uh, endorsee, you know, for a major corporation. It's a pretty cool thing to be able to do, you know. So I'm happy well, with it. It's very cool. It's and I I think the message that I want my kids to listen to is the fact that everything's a bit of a long game you know you, you nothing happens like like this instant culture where you get fame straight away if you launch if you put a video on youtube or if you get a um you know somebody to share something on insta or whatever that everybody thinks it happens overnight but it doesn't it's a real long game that you have to play in music and you yes. know and those people that are aware of that will be happier and do better in the long run rather yep. than those that are thinking you know, i'm just going for my big signature deal on my premiere kit and that's it i've made yeah. it the drum show you know it's more than that you know I, yes. I'm, I'm hoping that that's um yeah. the sort of thing that you agree with definitely absolutely yeah right it's, uh, yeah let me get some questions from our students in because obviously unfortunately yes. it's school time so they're not <laughs> out at the moment. but you know we have had a few people we had hundreds of people send messages through but we've tried to narrow them down to maybe just three of the um maybe the most interesting i'm going to pass over to Stu, who's in the same room but on the same screen there he hey. is <laughs> so yeah shout ahead Stu. Hopefully you can hear me can you hear me all right Louis? Is that good? yes i can yeah yeah all good yeah so Obviously, um, a lot of our students have seen you on YouTube. That's where they've kind of recognised you from, whether it's the, the old video of you playing the Oh Holy Night solo, or the newer stuff doing the Disney arrangements. I think um, you worked on, with Callum um, doing those arrangements. And they were just wondering, like, why did you get into the YouTube stuff? Like, how did you get into it as well? And then what is the sort of value of doing those high quality YouTube videos and clips and stuff? Cool. Well, I've got a lot to say on this, Great. but I'll try and condense it as best I can. Um, a lot of what you end up doing is it, it's it's all about nation, but a lot of it's also luck. Uh, I think you, I think you need to make your own luck, um, and you need to uh, get out there and start trying to do things creative. I, for me, I. I recorded those old videos back in 2011, 2012, uh, playing some of those Wayne Bergeron covers and Maynard Ferguson covers. And I don't really know why I recorded them in the first place. And you've got to remember as well that the kids that are watching now probably expect this to like, just to be normal. At the time, it wasn't normal. <laughs> um, like it was probably weird for people to go on their Facebook, which at the time wasn't that, that new. And sorry, it wasn't that old. And YouTube and see this kid like, I'm trying to hurt himself trying to play this stuff you know um but it, it i remember putting the videos out or at least sending them to a couple of people and they said put them out i, I remember feeling quite sort of subconscious and british about it at the time and i um 
so I put them out and they I ended up at the end of all of that sort of period of time with about maybe nine and a half thousand subscribers, which was cool because it went I think it went sort of around the Trumpet Herald community on the forums and things like that. I wasn't expecting it to do anything, really. I just thought, oh, wow, I accidentally hit a double high D. Let's just put this on YouTube, you know, yeah. <laughs> and um, and that that then I didn't do anything for ages. OK. Um, and then when I went to college, it was at that point that I had started making some um, good friendships with some really great musicians. You know, I'm very fortunate to be in London where um, there's just loads of great musicians. And generally speaking, the people that work are all really nice, um, which is really helpful. Um, and I remember speaking to Callum about recording this Let It Go thing. I remember seeing like a French horn player recording a karaoke version on YouTube of Let It Go. And I thought, this is a cool tune. This would work really well for High Note Trumpet. Yeah. Um, he's just doing a karaoke version. He's got 500,000 views. Um, why don't we try and do like a big band version that's a bit different, you know? And Callum, kind of, we weren't that close at the time. Didn't really know him very well. We worked together on a few gigs, but we, he sat in the green room and sort of worked it all out and... Um, came up with the concept and this first video took like six months to come out it was so new to me i've been doing some mixing before at school but nothing much and my mix on that video for me i'm you know obviously i i, I see a huge improvement to, to the work that i've done since but it was a good start it's kind of thrown in the deep end right so i contacted some of these people that i knew some of my favorite musicians that i thought you know uh, would be up for it you know this is the thing it was just a fun favor a bit of fun and um I released the video and it did did pretty well and, and people were asking for another one so we thought oh well let's do another one let's maybe do a bit of a disney theme because you know i'm pretty i'm personally speaking i'm not particularly precious uh, about um original music i'm i'm more in, more interested in what the audience is going to like uh and everyone's different but for me i'm not particularly purist about it i'm thinking right well this is a great tune let's use this to our advantage and then let's try and do something else with it the people are going to go oh that's cool you know that was kind of the thought process no, nothing more so we, we took go the distance we did that and then then we started thinking oh great we'll do a patreon and and we'll try and build this thing up a bit more and we'll try and release a video a month and then you start realizing wow that's like a full-time job it really is because trying to get all these amazing musicians together particularly pre-covid was difficult because they were all so great and they were all working all the time you know and then having a space to do it in we were recording it in my flat when i was a student you know and it doesn't seem crazy nowadays because everyone's doing it with yeah. COVID videos and everyone's doing lockdown videos. But at the time I wasn't. And maybe I got lucky because I, I started doing them before everybody else. But, you know, a lot of things go into these, but you don't need to to get started. You don't need to do all of that. I'll just quickly talk about the value that I've got from it. You know, for example, I wouldn't be doing this webinar today if it wasn't for that. You know, um, I wouldn't be playing around the world as a guest soloist if it wasn't for that. Um, I probably wouldn't have uh, been. I probably wouldn't have done the big fat band if it wasn't for that, because I don't think Gordon would have trusted a 23 year old he never heard, even if Wayne had said it was OK. So, you know, there's there's a lot of things that, the, that this can lead to because you're putting yourself out there. And the other thing is, if you do it young enough. You know, if you do it young enough, what you'll start to realize is that the it is that you will get better really quickly if you keep doing it. Like you have to do it. It's it's a lot of work, but you'll get better at it really quickly. And you'll also get way better at playing because you'll be listening to yourself. And you if you're like me, you will only release your absolute best. Like if something isn't quite right for me, I just do it again. I'm not I'm not a like a process over product guy i'm much more of a product over process if the product at the end is killing i'm going to pursue for the product and that i think has been helpful to the success because i've realized as well that over time people nowadays are expecting more out of musicians because recording has become easier for everyone to do um you know, recording this stuff is this is a, that's a whole another conversation about how you actually do it. But I tell you what, YouTube is your friend for learning anything at the moment. <laughs> um, just get on there and just just 
try and figure out what you need to learn. You know, the hardest thing about learning on YouTube is learning what to search for, because if you don't know what it is you're looking to learn, it's really difficult to find the tutorial. So that's generally speaking what I spend most of my time explaining to other people how to do is to know what to search for. You know, like if I see this really cool video edit thing and I want to learn how to do it, I need to know what that effect is called. Yeah. But if I don't know what the effect is called, how can I find out how to do it? So that's the hardest thing. But if you can get over that for whatever it is that you're going to do, find out exactly what it is that you need to that you need to um to learn you can learn anything it doesn't matter so it's been a huge influence on my life doing it um not everyone uh is going to get tons of subs but the people that are persistent that upload uh, i'm uh, i don't upload regularly i should but that's kind of i've got some plans for that um but if you can upload regularly to a schedule and if you can upload quality over quantity you will end up with you know success um don't lower your quality to to um to everybody's need for quantity because youtube is funny you know these subscribing things that the kids will all totally get this right so um you know you subscribe to all these people on youtube and what you're actually subscribing to is effectively like another television channel and what you're expecting is like over time for them to be releasing videos and every video they release is like a new episode to that TV channel or that TV show. And some things like Friends, the TV show, you'll look back and you you can watch any of those shows because they it, it doesn't matter in which order you watch them, right? But some, and, and hopefully a music one's a bit like that, but some people like if you watch Linus Tech Tips or uh, any of the tech stuff or any gaming stuff, for example, there a lot of it is going to be done in 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 order. So people are always expecting content out every day. Every day we need to see the new thing. We need to see the new thing every day. But I would suggest that you don't do that and just get your quality down if you are going to do this because your videos can be watched if you're going to do what I do at any point, you know. And sometimes they can blow up at any point as well. You know, they can get really big randomly. Like, I'll give you one example of, like, totally random YouTube success video. I recorded a video of um, uh, the Ennio Morricone, Good, the Bad, and the Ugly trumpet solos. <laughs> and I literally recorded it just like, oh, maybe the fans will want to see this, all right? So I just put my phone out. I didn't even get a proper camera out. I couldn't be bothered. I, I just put my phone out, film played it through a couple of times, got the take I wanted, put it together, shoved it on Facebook and YouTube. And that video has ended up with something like 2 million views, 1.2 on YouTube. And that's, that, that video has performed better than all of my other videos in the time that it's been on there. And it's so <laughs> strange, right? It's weird, but it is, you have to think about what, if, if you want to do this, you have to think a little bit about what people want to see. And then you have to try and be clever about how you deliver the content. So it is, really cool but you'll also surprise yourself at what simple things like that that video i did for the good the bad and the ugly that's the most that's the simplest video i've done and it's got the most views or at least the fastest growing number of views so you'll surprise yourself i think about what you can what you can accomplish but definitely definitely something to pursue seeing as though you can't do anything else at the moment <laughs> no, absolutely true man absolutely true and you know i think for me as steve's got another question about arranging but you know calamau and you know the original stuff that you put out you know with the let it go the hercules stuff that was all kind of what was the question to yeah so we've got a load of load of kids at the band um that love composing and arranging and they're trying to do their own little bits for little ensembles that they had obviously pre-covid and things like that um and they're just wondering how important is it that the arrangement or the the composition suits your style so obviously a lot of your stuff is the, the high note kind of maynard-esque wayne-esque trumpet playing so how important is it that it, it kind of suits your style and then also, if you've got any advice um, for composing or arranging in those yeah. styles. Yeah, yeah, cool. So um, when I uh, record, uh, when we go through the process of building these tracks, it starts off with Callum and I sitting down for an afternoon and talking about it and talking about what sort of vibe we want to go with. And also like 
um, how it builds and things like that, how long it is, what solos there are going to be. We kind of get like a broad idea down of what it's going to be. And the thing, the great thing about Callum and and me is that Callum fills all the gaps in my knowledge, and I think I fill all the gaps in his. So we work really, really well. Um, so I do the production and things like that, and he does all the arranging. And we're both quite funny people with regards to like, like optimizing our efficiency and our time to be able to like do the things we're best at rather than wasting time learning to do things that the other person is better at. So it, it's good like that. And Callum, all the technical side of the arranging thing, like all the understanding and knowledge like that, he's got down and taken care of. He's so quick at it, it doesn't really matter. But that's the sort of stuff that if you can be really good at, the creative workflow is more like streamlined. If you're struggling with your te technical ability in terms of composition and understanding how chords work and things like that and how harmony works, it, it will slow you down because you'll be spending more time thinking about what note goes here when you should know. So definitely working on technical sort of understanding of these things is really great for the creative workflow. And then basically the way it goes is he puts down like this really bare structure, sends it over to me and I critique it and tell him what I think it needs and what it doesn't. And then we have a debate on whether or not it's what it is. And it's a very, very partner based arranging. I mean, he, act, I would always say he does the arrangement, right? But I heavily influence like the way it's going. Um, and we always, I mean, we always try to make the the arrangements interesting. Callum is a bit more like uh, he wants to be 100% true to the melody, whereas I'm a little bit more like I don't mind veering, veering off it ever so slightly if it's recognizable, right? But these are all questions you can ask yourself. Um, with regards to actually like arranging this stuff, you know, maybe start off small. Maybe start off with a smaller group and really get to grips with making sure there's enough space for everyone and making sure that you don't overwrite, you know? Um, yeah, I guess with regards to tips, let's say that you're going to do a brass quintet rather than a whole big band that could sort of just be a good start off and, and really think about your melody, get it across whatever instrument you want it to be on. Think about what you want to do with regards to your ideas that you want to put inject into the project. So if you want to take a tune and turn it into like a Latin tune, you know, maybe a Christmas tune, you want to do Latin, get some percussion involved, you know. So just have have a creative brainstorm about what you want to do. And then you then you need to rely a little bit on your technique, your harm, understanding harmony, things like that to, to get you through the sort of writing process. And then you want to make sure you, you, you tweak it so that it you're thinking about your target audience a bit and you're thinking about what they're going to enjoy. So I'll give you a, a cool example of a, of a arrangement that we kind of worked on together was last Christmas's keep calm and carol on. I can't remember how many tunes there are. It's something like 50 tunes. And Callum was like having an absolute laugh, like trying to fit in two bars as like a counter melody to the actual melody of a different Christmas carol just stuck in the middle of it. And that was a, almost an exercise for him to see how much he could squeeze into this and also an exercise for everyone else who's listening to see how many things they could hear. But you could do fun, creative things like that with these, uh, with these things. And it's really important that that the uh that, that you're thinking about like you, if you're going to do anything jazz related right ja jazz is quite a niche um uh genre anyway try not to mix everything up too much try and be quite understanding about what target audience you want you know some people will tell you that um you know, it should be what you like. And if other people like it, that's cool. And maybe that's maybe that's right for you. But for me, I think about the people and like some of the kids that have watched my stuff. I did not expect this to happen. But now I know that that's kind of a bit of an audience for me. The kids watching the things and really enjoying it. I need to make sure that the next few videos we're going to put out, everyone is going to enjoy it. And uh, and that a lot of that will come down to the arrangements. So you've got to really 
do think a little bit about that. Don't put like a, a 15 minute tenor saxophone solo in the middle of the tune because everyone's just going to turn off, you know, and that's not to suggest you haven't got an amazing sax player. It's just that yeah, a lot of people aren't watching my videos for 15 minute sax tunes, uh, 15 minute sax solos. So I have to be a bit careful about how the, the solos come out. I want everyone in the band to get a chance to play and I wouldn't have them in the band if they couldn't play. But I also have to recognize that just a little bit of here and a little bit of there is much more attractive to people that want to just hear high trumpet because it adds a bit of variance. But at the same time, uh, you know, it doesn't take away from what people are watching it, watching the video for in the first place. So it's very important just to get that together. Don't overwrite. Don't don't think of this huge thing. Try and get it down into into its um into its best form i think so yeah hopefully that's useful <laughs> yeah great advice mate and i love the idea of you know setting out the geography of where you want the chart to go you know like the big picture rather than like getting a lot of kids will just start writing right bar one bar two and they've got no Absolutely. idea yeah like, have a concept have a have an idea of how it's going to end yeah. have an idea of how it's going to start and then the middle should figure itself out yeah. yeah brilliant advice uh, absolutely brilliant and we've got one more from Stu um yeah this Stu. is just uh, from one of our up-and-coming trumpet players wonderful Tess who's one of our female trumpet players a bit of a superstar does some sax as well and everything um and she was just wondering if you could play us something live on camera now <laughs> yeah I'll I'll give it a go I haven't played yet today but it'll be fun um I don't know whether you tell me if you can hear this you can hear it cool yeah, I'm totally it's Christmas <laughs> there you go. Merry Christmas, Tess. Uh, Merry Christmas, Tess. I think that's very cool because you know she'll be expecting triple A's and like we're, like, <laughs> we're doing it old school. <laughs> <laughs> she can go on YouTube for that. <laughs> yeah, totally cool. Um, well, we're going to start winding it up. It's been great. And um, just a couple of more things to go through, really. From my point of view, it's great that we've got Tess who plays the trumpet because we try really hard to, um, you know, say to both girls and boys, you know, a band, a good band is a band which is balanced. You know, we're trying to do it from the ground up so that girls feel that they've got as much right as anybody to be playing and I think that's the case with you and your band if you know we book them on merit don't we we don't book them because we're trying to fill holes we book them because they're the best person for it and I think that's a good way to try and approach the industry what's your take on that yeah I mean for me uh I believe my band is kind of a meritocracy I I, I look at the people around me I look at my favorite players I also look at people I want to be with this yeah. is a huge thing, right? You know, um, and if you can, if you know, if you tick those boxes for me of, of being a great player uh, and, and you're a cool person to hang out with, um, you know, there's no reason you can't play in a band like mine, honestly. Um, I think it's really important that everyone's given, you know, as equal opportunities as possible to come through, uh, come through the ranks. But really, it, it, it's it's up. It's open for anyone, you know, um, be it a boy or a girl. It doesn't. To me, none of that really matters. I'm not particularly interested in that. So um, I think it's it's better that you just focus on getting better, get focus on playing as well as you can, and and one day you'll be you, you you'll, you'll be playing with 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 the greats. It's not it's it's nothing more to it in my opinion. I, I I honestly, you know, my sister's playing in the band. She's there because she's one of the best trombone players I know. So it, it's not you know it's uh it's not it, there's nothing more to it for me. So I think you guys you guys play together enjoy playing together uh shouldn't make shouldn't matter too much i think just uh yeah hey, just just totally try, try, strive for strive for greatness <laughs> yeah honestly and it's it's really down to the kids to live the life they want to leave it's not up to somebody else to say you will get this gig if you go here it's up to them to put the time and effort in if they want to go and use spotify or streaming services because they want to use it as part of their development part of their building of their career then it's up to them to do that. Yeah. No, nobody's and, going to do it for them. The other thing about, you know, Tess and maybe some other girl players, you know, it's like it, if you're as good as any anyone else, like sometimes it's really cool for, for, for other, you know, for bands to have someone who's maybe slightly different to the majority of the band. And the only way that that's going to change and it become equal is, is if we get more opportunities to, 
like have you guys you know come and i i mean to be honest with you i i would love to have more girls in the band so i think you guys should work as hard as you can and and get there and you know maybe one day we can do it you know it, it'd, it'd be awesome that's it will of- it will definitely happen because i mean there are amazing players out of georgina jackson oh you know, she's amazing some, like, alex without there are some seriously cool jazz cats out there so yeah. it, you know we need to make this happen and there's tons and tons and tons of amazing classical um yeah. like uh, string players you know most of the orchestras now are pretty much 50 50 so you know there's every opportunity so you know yeah cool. very cool well uh, the last one then for me really um my granddaughters uh they absolutely love um let it go they sing along to it all the time um but to be honest my favorite has always been hero to zero from hercules <laughs> yeah so you know i mean i'm a big fan of alan menken you know the oh. disney songs you know i'm totally with you on this you know you play for your audience you want people to engage it, you know, if you could go back in time and say to yourself, you know, you want to do this now as quick as you can. And, you know, what would be that one bit of advice you would want to give yourself? The one bit of advice I would give myself. What's so it talking to a 15 year old Louis, right? Yeah, pretty much. OK. I think the 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 most important thing that you can do as a young player is get your concept together about what you want to sound like. Now, this is a hard thing to explain, and some people will already be doing it, and some people won't be doing it because they think that they just need to continue playing the way their teacher is asking them to. Now, the most important thing is that this is as a player, and as a player really only, or, you know, I'm speaking it this way. If if you don't know how you want to end up sounding, you'll never get there. Yeah. So it's really important that you listen. You go on YouTube, you check out videos, you check out things on Spotify. You listen to all the players on your instrument that you love. And you listen and listen and listen and listen and let it drill itself in. You know, and learn it all, get it all in, take it all in by osmosis, all of these things. And, and, and eventually you'll come up with an idea of what you want to sound like, not what someone else wants you to sound like or what your teacher's telling you to sound like. You need to know exactly what you want to sound like because without knowing exactly what you want to sound like, you can't achieve sounding like you. So for me, you know, I I would listen, I would go on YouTube This is back in the day before there was quite so much on YouTube and I would type in Wayne Bergeron and I would always like filter by upload date so I'd always see the latest video every single day. Watch the latest video. It says new video. Watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it. And by osmosis, the way he plays was kind of drilled into me. I actually think I probably, my concept sounded more like Wayne back then, just because I wanted to sound so much like him so much when I was younger. Um, and that really helped me give me a direction and a goal of where I wanted to go sonically, you know, um, and musically. So that was super important. And then as I've got older, I've actually been influenced by more players, people I've played with next to, but also people on the internet that I've heard or people from 1950 that I had never heard of before who are absolutely amazing players like Harry James and some other people like Conrad Gozzo. They, 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 they've, they've kind of influenced me in a different way. So my concept has changed over time and will continue changing. But without having that seed in the first place, without having a really clear idea of what, where you want to go, you'll never get there. So it's really important. If you want to be a classical player and you want to be the best soloist in the world because you can't do anything but listen to classical trumpet, some people are like that. And that's great. You need to have exactly an idea of how you want to play everything. Not because your teacher tells you to play this bit slower or faster, because you've decided that's what you're going to do because you think it sounds best. So come up with a really, really clear idea of how you want to sound and then focus on that and go towards that goal because that will you will skip a lot of unnecessary problems and you'll just you'll you'll get there faster i, I promise 
Yeah, man, that's a great advice. Uh, absolutely stunning. So, you know, thanks very much to Louis. I've got to say thanks to Yamaha for facilitating this. Yes. We really appreciate everything that you've done and the support. And this is the first in a, hopefully a series of little things that Yamaha are going to help us do. This with Louis, but hopefully with Louis playing with one of the bands next year in 2021. So, you know, for all those kids that are listening, you know, keep trying, keep practicing. I love the music, you know, and don't let anybody tell you no. You yes. go and do what you want to do. And, you know, we can all appreciate the genius that is. Mr. Louis Dowswell. <laughs> Thank you very much, folks. Have a great one. We'll see you all soon. Bye. Cheers, guys. Thanks.